right, you guys ready? I'm, yeah, let's go. Uh, as you, like, this is something that uh, several of you, many of you already know, but those of you who are new or those of you who have been new for us for a bit, uh, give you a heads up. Um, I was born in Korea, but when I came to the United States, I came at a very young age, and one of the gifts my mom gave me was the ability to assimilate quickly, and that meant that she no longer spoke Korean around the house so that I can learn English faster, and it really worked. Okay, and, but the, the thing about it is, is that I did lose my ability to speak Korean. Yeah, and so, but I still enjoyed the cooking that my mom uh, made. I mean, it was just scrumptious, and Korean food is like, how many of you are like into Korean food? Really, you guys are missing out. Okay, anyway, especially Korean barbecue. Uh, no? Oh, come on. All right, give it up for Korean barbecue, man. <laughs> and so, recently, my family, we went to a Korean barbecue place. We, we researched, and we wanted to have a Korean barbecue, an authentic Korean barbecue experience. And boy, when we got out of the parking lot, stepped into the restaurant, and I knew, hey, it's looking really good, because all I see are Koreans. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, when you see that, you know that, hey, it's a bit more authentic. There's a lot of, there's a high level of credibility going on right there. And so, I mean, I don't know what Korean things typically are. I just knew my mom's cooking, and I just knew that it's delicious, right? And so we're going in there and say, okay, guys, okay, girls, look, we sit down, we just got there, we got, we're seated, and, and they were all nice, and, and, oh, thank you. Appreciate that, bro. And... <laughs> And I sat down, and we ordered the dish, right? Like, we, we don't, we, I didn't know how to pronounce it. But it had beef in it. Okay? So we were really happy. And so once we ordered, I was like, all right, here we go. And they had this charcoal pit in the middle of the table. It was whole authentic bit, right? And by the way, uh, if those of you in the lights, let's have the lights as bright as possible in this room. But anyway, it was so cool. They start bringing things out I have never seen in my life. They started bringing things out to the point where I purely looked at me and said, Honey, are we supposed to eat that or is that like table dressing and setting? We didn't know. And, and I was like, okay, I'm just in for the experience. It's good. It's good. And it started coming out. And, of course, uh, those of you who have been there, you know this. But the waiter kids come and goes like, yeah, it's da 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 He talks talks about it. and he starts cooking stuff and and we're I was just watching him going what do I do what do I do you know <laughs> I wasn't sure do we supposed to eat oh by the way they gave us chopsticks and I know how to use chopsticks right like I can go all Miyagi on a fly and everything right however these were the absolute worst chopsticks ever invented by man I mean, you could not pick anything up with these things. So we're like, we have these like defective chopsticks and we had settings and colors and things I have never seen in my life, right? And all the while, you know, the, the waiter's looking at me and like, hey, bro, that's my home. You know, like, you know what's going on, right? And I just look at him like, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm like, just, I'm, I'm just kind of nodding my head and, you know, and... And finally, the girl said, what are we supposed to do when the waiter was away? Like, I looked at him and said, I don't know, sweetheart. <laughs> I don't know. What do we do? What sauce? I didn't know what the sauce was. Well, I did know what sesame oil was. That's about it. And then he finally came to us, and, and he noticed that I, we weren't really engaged with the meal. And the waiter just flat out asked me, you're Korean, right? And I just looked at him, and I had to confess, right? He said, dude, I just looked apart. I have no clue what I'm doing here. <laughs> and I said, do you mind, like, telling us what to do? <laughs> and because the whole time, the waiter would came by the table, and they were like, you know, you're supposed to, you're supposed to, you're supposed to tell your people. 
You're supposed to tell your family. You're supposed to. And I had no idea. Can you help me? I felt like really small in that moment, right? And I also asked for forks, which was, you know. <laughs> you just, you know, like, you just put yourself at a different level. So here I am, and everybody, the entire place, because when you walk in anywhere with purity, everybody looks at her, you know, because you guys met her. And because and they, they're like, like, that's like, that's one lucky dude, right? Because it's proof. She, she's proof God loves me, I promise you. And so here we are in a restaurant full of Koreans, and because, we're, you know, like, I'm all Korean, I have two girls that are half Korean, and she's not Korean at all, right? Blonde hair, blue-eyed, Southern Belle. And so everybody's looking, and I'm embarrassed. <laughs> because I'm supposed to know what to do. And I have no clue. How many of you ever been in a situation where you are supposed to do something and you have no clue how to do it? It was awful. And I was thinking about that situation and honey, I'm going to talk about it in a sermon song soon. So I'm talking about it. Because I think that describes where a lot of us are. Well, you're supposed to be doing something, but you're not. You're supposed to be some point of your life by now, but you're not. See, some of you, you're supposed to have had a certain level of education by now, but you haven't. You're supposed to be married by now, but you're not. You're supposed to have had this salary by now, or so you thought, and you don't. Right? You're supposed to, you're supposed to. In fact, you're supposed to be emotionally mature. You're supposed to be over that. You're supposed to be handling that attitude. You're supposed to be able to be more mature about certain things. But the truth is, we're not. And if you've been in that situation for a long time, it brings about a point of uh, a pain. If we're really, really honest, that you're supposed to, but you're not, that hurts. How many of you can relate? It hurts. And that dissonance is disillusioning. And I think too many of us are right there. You're supposed to be at a stage of marriage and having enjoyed a certain level of intimacy and confidence and relationship. But your marriage is still as rocky as ever. Your kids are supposed to be better off than they are. But they're struggling. But they're struggling. And I've heard that a mama's happiness is relative to the level of misery that their children are. Ladies, am I right? And this pain is a real deal. And behind all of the smiles and behind all the, the great presentation that you guys bring, there's a lot of us that are hurting. And a lot of that pain is, is connected. And that's because the size of the vision that God has for your life is directly related to the amount of pain and discomfort that you're willing to endure. I'll say that again because you didn't catch it the first time. The size of the vision that God has for you the life that you're called to live is directly related to the amount of pain and the discomfort that you're willing to endure. There's proof throughout Scripture. Take Moses, for example. He is probably the most influential leader of the Old Testament. Can you imagine leading millions of people, 
leading them from having undergone a major rescue operation to a major mobilization and to a major relocation project, all the while people are griping their heads off at you. It took them 40 years. Much success, but at the same time, a lot of pain along the way. For example, did you know there was a time when his sister turned on him? There was a rebellion, right? It was horrible. But Moses was able to endure the pain, and because he was able to endure the pain, he accomplished more than just about any Old Testament character ever accomplished. Right? The Apostle Paul. What a huge vision God placed on his life. I mean, take the gospel to the Gentiles. That's us, by the way. In fact, we're here because of the ministry of the Apostle Paul. But Paul went through a great amount of pain. Jesus, always the ultimate example, with the greatest and the biggest vision ever, right? The salvation of the world. It doesn't get any bigger than that. It doesn't get any more consequential and important than that. And yet it took torture, crucifixion, and the weight of all the sins of humanity that has ever have lived, will live upon him. And he had to bear and undergo excruciating pain. Pain that none of us in this room have ever experienced and none of us have ever felt. And by God's grace, None of us have to because he did. What I'm getting to is there is a principle in scripture where the size of God's vision for your life is relative to the amount of pain and discomfort that you're willing to bear. And the point and the problem with where so many of us are is because we know we ought to be somewhere, but we're not. And that gap, that tension, brings about pain in life. By the way, I am just so grateful that we serve a risen Savior who understands the pain of a big vision. In fact, you have a dream for your life. You have a direction. There is, if some of us may describe it, a calling. Right now, you're frustrated because what you know that God has promised, what you know that God has called you to, what you know in the deep inside of you, the longing your soul is craving for is not that which you are currently experiencing. The Lord understands. And because God's word is so precious and powerful, We are going to learn an important lesson today. And some of you are here this morning to hear this message providentially. Because some of you walked in here this morning. Some of you watching online. Some of you may be listening to it later online. Here's the deal. You came in here and you've been dealing with the pain. You've been struggling with the tension between the vision and reality. And you know what? You've been enduring that tension for so long, you're just about to throw in the towel. You're just about the point of going like, how much longer do I have to put up with this? How much longer do I have to deal with it? And in fact, some of you came in here and you said inside, God, if you don't talk to me today, I'm done. If I don't hear something today, it's over. I need something. I believe God has that for you. Summed up in two words. You know what God wants to let you know? Don't quit. Don't quit. God has never quit on you never will quit on you, and don't you dare quit on the God that won't ever quit on you. Because there is a hope for you. I know it seems things are dry and dead in your life. 
Because you've been waiting, you've been struggling with the tension, and all you've seen around you is just dead ends. All you see are obstacles. But God wants us to help us realize that you never, ever give up on the God who can do the impossible. If you have your Bible, open your Bible to Ezekiel chapter 37. Ezekiel chapter 37. And what we're going to unpack is in a particular powerful portion what he tells us, these simple, applicable truths of what we are to do, what we're supposed to do when we're in a dry spot, when we're in a dead end, when we feel like we've got no hope and we're about to quit, Okay. What do you do? Okay. First thing we find, according to Scripture, I know things are looking bleak. I know things are hard. And you're tempted not to do this. But what the Word of God tells us to do is to trust Him in it. Some of you are in a bad spot. <laughs> and when it comes to what makes our struggle, <laughs> um, you know, even greater than it is, is that we have things called social media. And we look at all these other people, it seems like God's blessing. Their success that for them, oh, it's happening for them. And you know it's not happening for you, right? And we get frustrated. And we get to think, God, you're supposed to. Because I'm supposed to be somewhere but that I'm not. You're supposed to. And this is where we get messed up because we oftentimes, if we're not careful, in fact, we began to address this last week, but we need to completely destroy this myth And it's a myth that says that if you follow God, God will always lead you in places of abundance. That is not true. That's a myth. It's a lie. And if we buy into the lie, we will find ourselves at points of frustration that God has never intended for us to be in. Okay? In fact... The reason why we easily buy into the lies is because that's what all of us want. We want to go into an established place. For example, let's say that you are studying law and you want to become a lawyer. Well, guess what you want to do? You want to step into a situation of an established firm that has great reputation and gives you a great salary package, right? Who doesn't want that? Some of you have visions of, like, stepping up on stage, Right? And you always envision that you're going to step onto a stage with a huge crowd. You don't think about actually growing a crowd, but you want to step into a stage with a crowd already there. Isn't that the imagination? Surely. God wouldn't call us to places where we have to start at the bottom, would he? Surely God wouldn't put call us to places of pain and discomfort, would he? Let's look at Ezekiel. Ezekiel 37, verse 1. Ready? And normally we stand as we honor the reading of God's word. I'm going to break it down differently this morning. So if you will remain seated and we'll take it a few verses at a time. All right? Ezekiel 37, verse 1 says this. The hand of the Lord was on me. Let me pause. Ezekiel was not living a life of disobedience. The hand of God was on his life. Okay? Are you with me? And he, that is God, brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in. Where did he set me in? Set me in the valley. And let's read it. And it was full of opportunity with incredible social life in a nice house and a huge salary. Isn't that what the the text says? Some of you are like, hey, what's that translation? What can I get by that one? 
right? That's not what it says, does it? He set me in the middle of a valley. Okay? It's not a high place. It's a low place. And it was full of what? Bones. That means there were things that at one time was alive, but is now what? So here's Elijah. Excuse me, that's Elijah. Ezekiel. <laughs> Sorry. I do love Elijah, but we're not talking about him today. Here's Ezekiel, a prophet of God, a man of God, doing what God would have him to do. And be it physically or in a vision, God plants him and brings him to a place of dryness, discomfort, and deadness. I don't care how bad your life is. If you're taken to a valley of dry bones, it's a downgrade. Am I right? Now, many times, you wonder, God, why do I have to go through this? And here's why. God intentionally allows dry places. In fact, his hand can actually lead you there. Just so that he can show you who he is and we can understand and know more who he is, know more about who we are, and have the opportunity to become more than we are. You tracking me? It's by design at times. It's by design at times. Verse 2, he led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley. Bones that were, what, very dry. No, 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 it didn't say dry. It was very dry. You know why it was very dry? Because it's been dry for a long, long time. I know for a lot of you, you're doing what you're supposed to. You've done it. You've done what you thought was right. And you know what? But regardless, regardless how faithful you've been, you're in the valley. And all you see around you is dead and dead and dead and what? Dead. Pieces of it everywhere. It's chaos. And here's the thing. You thought, okay, this is just a blip. But you've been dealing with it for a long time. You've been dealing with it a long time. Perhaps it's been a dream that you've been holding on to, but you know what? It's been so long you're beginning to forget the details of your dreams. You've had hope. In fact, you were effervescent with hope at one time, but right now you're in a situation where you feel like all of your hope has been dried up. Why? Because it's not just been a little bit in the valley. It's been a very long time. And you're like, God, why am I here? I don't understand. Here's what I've noticed happens in the progression of VDB. That's Valley of Dry Bones. Okay? What happens is that you step into a dryness, right? And you're like, I can handle that. Because you're right now, you step into it and your skin's still moist. But the dryness doesn't leave. It lingers. And it stays. And you begin to shrivel. And here's the where we get. We get despondent. Because after a while... We'll get despondent. 
See, dryness, over time, we have bouts with doubt, and then we end up in despondency. And if you stay here too long, we start being tempted to make a choice. And one of the choices is disobedience. And here's what we do. We rationalize this. God, you're, you're not doing anything. I've been here forever. I don't know if you're ever going to do it. And what we do is some of us choose disobedience. But the problem when we choose, and every time we choose disobedience, we result in distance. Distance from God. And some of you here today, the reason like you feel like you can't connect is because there's been there's a distance. The fact is God hasn't left you, but what disobedience always does is creates the rift between your closeness, between you and God, which creates distance relationally, not salvation-wise if you're a Christian. You don't lose your salvation, but you can lose your the closeness. You have distance. Or at the point of despondency, Here's what we can choose. Desperation. See, we can choose, instead of being disobedient, we can choose to be desperate for God. We could choose where we are, all that we want, all that we look for is him, and he will do something in our lives. And that's a lesson that is so important for us to learn. In fact, Jesus said it like this in Matthew chapter 5 or 6. He said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. For they will be filled. Literally, blessed are those who are desperate for God. Because they will be satisfied. See, if God can teach us to remain, get to the point of being desperate for him, that's when we understand the key to success in life, period. You see, success in life is not about stepping into abundance, but stepping into an obsession for Jesus and being desperate for what he can do rather than what we can do. Because if we are all about having Jesus add to our life, then we'd miss out on the Christian life. Because the Christian life isn't just based upon how morally we do our lives. The Christian life, if it doesn't involve the supernatural, then we have every reason to question if it's real or authentic at all. Because the Christian life is nothing less than a God-empowered, God-present life. And sometimes he intentionally has to put us in a valley of dry bones for us to come to a point of desperation where all we want is him. And that's what David wrote about. I long for you. I thirst for you in a dry and thirsty land. As a deer pants for water, so my soul longs and seeks after you. See, that is not a position of weakness. It's a position of power. Because when we are desperate for Jesus, that's when we encounter Jesus. And that's when we experience his
Deliverance, sorry, I'm right out of room. Because desperation for God will lead to a deliverance from God in one form or another. But the fact of the matter is too often we choose disobedience. And because we choose disobedience, we find distance. And you know what we've done? We wander around. And here's the thing about distance and disobedience and distance. After a while of beating our heads against the wall enough, we eventually get here anyway. Am I right? So the wise choice we go here first, right? And desperation is so important because we learn to be desperate in dry days. We won't forget him in fruitful days. And that's where we often go wrong. That's where we often mess up. I'm telling you, folks, I get it. I get how we'd be tempted to go here and go that way. Because I've been at the point of being desperate in my life. <laughs> yeah. I know what it's like to plead for Jesus to move in my life. I get it. I get what it's like to be way in over my head. I get it. In fact, I've been way over my head most of my ministry. I have. Where I'm like, God, if you don't show up and show out, it's over. But here's what I can tell you. Every time I've been there, it's not because I didn't go through pain. But I have seen his power. I have seen him come through. And some of you are there right now. And I get it. Sinfulness, our sinfulness, it can put us in the times of dryness and deadness. But the Lord is trying to teach you. The Lord is trying to teach you. So when you're in a dry place, when you're in a dead space, because some of you have been there recently. I know some of your stories. Trust him in it. Trust him. Second is believe him. First is trust him. Second is believe him. You gotta believe him. Verse three, he asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Okay, you're a prophet of God. You're Ezekiel, right? And you've already seen God do amazing things. But all of a sudden, he takes you to a place that's a cemetery, it's a graveyard where bones scattered everywhere, right? It's like a scene from the apocalypse or something, right? And God asked you the question, can they live? Now, let me ask you, if you were there, what would your answer be? Thank you for being honest. We're like, no way. It's dead. It's beyond hope. Lord, the bones are not just dry. They're very dry. Right? But Ezekiel, recognizing it was God who asked the question, check out his smooth answer. Sovereign Lord, you alone know, only you know. <laughs> Don't you love that answer? Talk about as neutral as you can get. Okay? Okay? But what we recognize is this. That was a passive answer. And the Lord asks for a positive response. Somewhere along the line, we got to recognize faith isn't passivity. It's not a passive thing. Faith and a life of faith is always active always engaging. It's always advancing in some form or another. And yet, here's what we do. We excuse a life of faith 
for our passive life. For example, here's what a lot of us do. We take something as precious as waiting on the Lord, and we use that phrase as an excuse to be neutral, to be like Ezekiel. Lord, you know. Oh, here's what we do. So God, I'm just waiting on you. When all we're doing is a whole lot of what? Nothing. We're just being passive. And here's what we forget more often than not. He's waiting for us to move. Because a holy, powerful, sovereign God doesn't need to catch up to us as if, oh, I'm just waiting on you, Lord. He's already been ahead of you. And here's what we do. We just have a spiritual excuse for our cowardice resignation. For a cowardly resignation. See, no. He's waiting on us to move. He wants us to believe enough to do something in the midst of the dead valley that we're in. So if you find yourself in a dead valley, not only must we trust him and his character, that he has a good purpose in it, but we need to believe him enough to know that we are not supposed to live like the skeletons. Check out verse 4. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the slaughter sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath into you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. And then you will know that I am the Lord. See, he told Ezekiel to preach to the bones. Have you ever talked to dead people? I have. I preached to some. I'm not preaching to you. I'm not saying you are. Some of you are like, oh, sorry. By the way, I am grateful that we're not the same church we were when we first started. Yeah. Because those, there are those of us those of you here, and I'm so grateful for you. You've been with me since the beginning of our journey together at First LG. But I'll be honest with you. It's not that I'm that funny, but occasionally I can tell a joke. And I remember there were some Sundays I would say something that would be really good. <laughs> and it would be crickets. I'm like, Man, what's wrong with it? They were dead. You know what it means, to, you know what it's like to talk to dead people? It's, it's, it's almost like you're walking around with, you know, with that movie, Sixth Sense Moment, right? Oh, I see dead people. But here's the deal. The reason why God tells you and puts you in a dry and dead place isn't for you to act like them. It's so that they could be like you. See, he told Ezekiel to preach to dry bones. And as it was for Ezekiel, it's also for us. See, God didn't bring you to a place of dryness just so you could sit around. See, God brought you to here to show that there is more life in Jesus than there is death in the world. That's why you're there. And you can't sit around. But the, here's what we have done, though. And we've got to be honest. Instead of letting our desperation for the Lord elevate us past the pain of the valley, we let the pain redefine our vision to reflect the valley. And we've settled. Why do we do that? Let me just share with you a few reasons. Because of fear. You're afraid. I'm afraid. Have you ever been afraid of something 
that you're not supposed to be afraid of? <laughs> I remember when I was a kid. There was this corner around the house that I could have sworn that there was something down there. Have you, you've done that. And every time you go around that corner, you go through that, around that corner as fast as you can. Because you know that thing is going to get you if you go too slow. Well, after a while, there was a neighbor who had to put an outdoor light around that corner. And I had the uh, audacity to look at that. I'm like, it was just a little empty spot. I just imagined that there will be some boogeyman, you know, just get you. Now, I, it's a silly illustration, but here's the, let me, let me explain how that is apropos to what we go through. I'm not saying that our pains and our fears are imaginary. But what I am saying is there's no thing in this planet that is more powerful than the Lord who promises to be with you as a follower of Jesus. That's the reality. I mean, this is what Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18 through 20 says. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. The riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. And his un- incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Resurrection power flows through our veins as followers of Jesus. And that means there's nothing that we need to fear. Do not fear pain nor discomfort. That's beneath you. Because he's given you all that you need to overcome them. And as long as we give into our fears, as long as we give into our pessimisms, we will find ourselves stuck in the VDB. But that's not all. That's not the only reason. The reason why we end up living in VDB is because we're lazy. These aren't all the reasons, but I'm hitting the major ones, okay? And the truth is, we're lazy. This is where we want God to do everything. Hey, the reality is there are some things that only God can do, but there are some things that only God wants to do through you. Did you hear me? Are you with me, or did I lose you just that at that point? See, there are some things that God will not do because we're supposed to do it. Can you imagine? For example, God told Noah to build the ark, right? What if Noah stood up there and said, Lord, I'm just praying to you. I just want you to know I love you. I'm just believing that you're going to cut down the timber. I just feel it inside. I just feel it so much. I'm fasting for it that you're, 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 putting, you're producing the nails and, and you're putting up the, you know, the, the, the sides. I, I just, I'm just believing that. Is that what Noah did? No. Because if he did, you know what God would have told him? Noah, pick up a hammer. <laughs> right? That's what he's telling some of you. Pick up your hammer. Pick up your hammer. Because there are some things that only you are supposed to do. And you are not going to move until you do it. And this reason is connected to the third factor of why we get stuck in the BDB.
we focus only on deliverance. We focus only on deliverance. Oh, Lord, when are you going to get me out? Oh, Lord, when are you going to get me out? I got to get out. I got to get out. I got to go. I got to pull me out. Move me. Help me. Get me out of here. Because you know, Lord, I, you know, I can't stay here. And you know what we overlook? Development. See, the fact of the matter is, the reason why we're not ready for the next level is because we're not ready for the next level. You understand? We haven't, we haven't taken care of the issues that God has intended for us to be taken care of in our lives. You know, see, here's what we often do. We say, Lord, I know that I'm stuck in the middle of nowhere and I have no opportunities, but boy, Lord, if you can just bring somebody over and if they really, really got to know me, they would overlook all my idiosyncrasies and my bad habits and my quirks and all my deficiencies and get me into that place that I've always dreamed of. That's the attitude where some of us take. And God says, work on your deficiencies. Fix your bad habits. Get rid of those quirks. Right? See, do you know why God has you stuck in that place? Here's the harsh reality, but I love you enough to be direct. It's because you're not ready. The reason why you're in the valley you're in It's because you're not ready to get out. And until you're willing to get past your fear, get past your laziness, and develop to being the person that God calls you to be in Jesus Christ, you're going to be there. And you don't want to be there. And therefore, surrender to him. And that's my third point. Surrender to him. So if you're taking notes, I told you they're basic, but they're essential. When you're in VDB, you got to come to the point of surrender. Where you give up your agenda, you give up your priorities, you say, okay, Lord, I give you, and I'm going to just do what you tell me. See, God told Ezekiel, all I want you to do is preach. Guess what he did? He preached. Here's what we don't forget, we we often forget. It's when we surrender that we experience the supernatural. See, Ezekiel was preaching, right? And scripture says, let's look at it, verse 7. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise. Can you imagine you're in a place of dead bones, you're like, I can't believe I'm doing this. It's a valley. No one else is here. It's just me. But I'm going to do what God tells me to do because it's not about me. So I'm going to preach. So he preached the word of God. He started preaching. There was a noise. Is that not a freak out moment or what? What? What is that? Then there was a noise, Scripture says. A rattling sound. Oh, man, can you see that it's building up in intensity and freakishness? And the bones came together, bone to bone. He kept on preaching. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Can you imagine that sight? Did you know? That God can bring dead things to life. Speak things into existence, the things that are not as if they are. That's who you serve. 
And some of us, we're complaining, we're about to give up in our very dead and dry spot when you got to realize he's not done with you. You got to keep surrendering to God. And here's what you do. Okay, and here's the power of the word of God. The power of the word of God is this, is that when you preach the word, that's the context when things come together. You know why our society is in the chaos that it's in? The things are falling apart because there is no basis of truth in this world anymore. The truth is God's word. Truth is the scripture. And we, as his followers, we need to be preaching more. We need to be prophesying more. You want society to come together? That's how it's done. And it's the context for a miracle. See, we find out later that God breathed into them and they came to life. And let's just read the passage. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come, breath, from the four winds and breathe into this lane that they may live. So I prophesied, prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them, and they came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Let me tell you something. The word of God is absolutely necessity. It is an absolute necessity. But the word of God by itself does not always bring life. In fact, that's why so many people go to church and hear the, word, hear the truth. And they look put together because the word of God has the ability to put things together. But they're still dead. That's why Billy Graham said years ago, 90% of people who are at church are lost. They walk around, you know, at the end of service, they'll tell me, hey, great message, Talon. But that doesn't mean that it's impacted them. See, what, what happens, what's so powerful is that the necessity of the word of God is this. When we present the word of God as he puts our life together, and when the word of God intersects with the spirit of God, that's when cemeteries become armies. That's when life erupts. That's when you're able to stand up on your feet and able to move out of VDB. And when you are standing, it's not just so you can get your life together. Some of you, God has stood, stood you up, okay? He fixed your job. He fixed your marriage. He fixed that other relationship. He fixed things in your life. But it wasn't just for you. You were called to be enlisted in an army. You were called to be a part of a life-changing, eternity-altering movement of an army of God. Where you deliver the good news of Jesus to everyone and at, at everywhere. Here's the question. Are you going to quit? Because God can bring your deadness back to life. God, who went to the cross, shed his blood, died and rose again, can bring you to a life that you know that he's called you to live. And it's a life of beautiful desperation for him. Because when we're there, that's when his deliverance is revealed. So don't you quit. Don't you give up on the Lord Jesus. He will never give up on you. And it's time that some of you move forward today and say, I give you my life. I will surrender to Jesus today. Let's all stand as we close in prayer.